I grew up in sort of a broken home. There was drugs, addiction, abuse. I made $10,000 on a Saturday, setting up Facebook ads, building websites that were just like copy and paste. Came in, I don't know what you're doing over there, but you need to call the damn leads. She handed me her wedding ring back and said, listen, I love you, but you're married to the job and the business right now. Trust the process. Overnight success happens 10, 20, 30 years in the making. Ever wondered how someone can transform their life, build a thriving business, and inspire countless others along the way? From tipping the scales at 300 pounds to becoming a beacon of health and motivation, our guest's journey is quite inspiring. Starting in tech support and rising to the VP of a multi-million dollar consulting firm, he's proven that with grit and a relentless mindset, anything is possible. A best-selling author, podcast pro, and the founder of Call the Damn Leads, he's generated seven-figure revenues across various industries. But it doesn't stop there. He's also a loving husband, father, constantly striving to live by example. With a strong focus on service and integrity, he lives by the mottos, call the damn leads and crush the day before it crushes you. Whether he's talking about redefining the value of time to save his marriage or achieving over 13 million in sales, his insights are bound to inspire you. So get ready for a dose of motivation and practical wisdom. Welcome to the show, Drewby Wilson. Hey, thank you, Linda, for having me. I'm so grateful for the time and opportunity. It means the world. Tell us your story and what was the moment when you thought enough is enough and decided to turn your life around? I'm very grateful to look back over 37 years of life and know that there were several of those moments. And I think the listener will also recognize that there's no one in particular moment that creates some crazy, crazy thing. It's a series of moments. And so for me, long story short version is I grew up in sort of a broken home. Mom and dad fought a lot. Dad was in and out. There was drugs, addiction, abuse, all the things that we could make a lot of excuses for as we grow up and we could fall into those very same patterns. I am very grateful at this point, looking back to know that I learned a lot of what not to do in life instead of taking those same paths of doing those things. And not to say that I didn't get involved in several running the streets and selling drugs and all those things that I shouldn't have been doing, but I had to learn from my own mistakes as well. And along that journey, I got really into sales. I never thought I'd be into sales. I always had kind of a weird resentment for salespeople. But what I learned is that I loved service. I loved helping people. As I was growing up in kind of a broken home, I was always looking for outside examples and people that I could learn from because I didn't have that. And so on my journey, when I was 200 pounds as a drug dealer running the streets, not eating well, not taking care of myself meeting a beautiful young lady, then going down that journey of like, okay, great. We got married. We have the son. I've put on 80 pounds again because I'm comfortable and Thanksgiving dinners. And I didn't want to be that person either. And my wife came to me at one point and said, listen, babe, I love you. You are an amazing husband and you're great. And this is all well and good. But at the same time, that attraction, that love, that's not there anymore. And it was kind of like, coinciding with the same feeling I had in my business where I was an employee and I was making the most sales and the most money in the business, but I was still only making $30,000 a year. And so I was trying to like figure out for myself, like, what am I doing in my life? What more is possible? And that's really where the whole crushing the day mantra and calling the damn lead started out because I've realized if I want to be a better version of me, it starts with me taking action every day. I can't let everyone else control what I'm going to do. I have to make those decisions. And so I started waking up earlier and going for long walks and listening to podcasts like this because I needed that motivation and inspiration. And I knew listening to someone that was going through that journey, I could relate to them. Fast forward in the last five, six years of entrepreneurship and on this journey, I've made a lot of sales. I was blessed to start a marketing company, which is where Call the Damn Leads came from. But more than anything, I've learned that by sharing those stories, going and putting those struggles out there and letting other people know what's possible, it's amazing the kind of connections and relationships that you can build and how much success will find its way into your life. And that's, again, Linda, why I'm so grateful to be here and to be able to share my story. Because if just one person hears it and grows and learns today, then it will be worth our time invested because time's our most valuable asset. We can't get it back. We can't buy it or win it in a poker tournament. So I hope whoever's mm -hmm. here with us today spending a little bit of that time is really going to enjoy what we get to talk about. 
I absolutely love your story. It's so powerful because sharing your story, I've got a similar story too. I haven't shared it with the world as well, but I've shared it with a lot of my podcast guests and it's very similar to yours. <laughs> so people don't, like in my professional world, people wouldn't know that. But, you know, what you said when you were raised in a bad upbringing, which I had a bad upbringing as well, and the fact that that taught you to not be like that and that drove you. And then you did your drug dealing, which some people will frown upon that, but then you taught yourself skills, you know, like street smart skills and the skills of sales and like you said, service as well. So you've used that past to your advantage. And I love the fact that you're constantly getting better and you're working on yourself and you knew when it was time to change and lose weight too. So very powerful, inspiring journey there. So I want to hear about your entrepreneurship journey and Take us through the roller coaster ride from being in tech support to VIP. <laughs> and then, yeah. and what made you want to leave that and start your own marketing agency? Yeah. So, again, I kind of grew up in the streets selling anything and everything I could get my hands on. As I got older and had a son, I realized I didn't want to end up dead or in prison. Mm -hmm. And so, I kind of made that shift out of the street hustler mentality into selling insurance. And I took my grind and hustle and I went and I picked up the phone and I just sold insurance and I put on my khakis and I did that for five years. And as I had mentioned a little bit earlier, I was one of the top producers in my market and I was kind of capped out. Like I was only making thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year. And as I went to my boss, I went, hey man, you know, I don't want to go back to the streets. I'm working really hard. I'm grateful and blessed because you gave me an opportunity, right? Like I don't want to not be grateful for this, but I also want to know what am I going to do to make six figures? Because that's kind of like every person's journey when they start entrepreneurship. It's like, man, if I could just make six figures, life would be sweet. And now that shifts because all the things that go on with inflation or whatever, but there's that arbitrary number. And so as a salesperson, when I went to my boss and I said, hey, I want to make more money, his response was, you just got to be patient. And in like 10 mm -hmm. years, It'll be your name on the door and you'll have all these things going on. Just go back there. Keep calling the leads. Do your thing. And I stomped back to my desk, pouty face. Because I was like, man, I don't want to wait 10 years. That's bull crap. That, I don't want to do that. And so I kind of went online and I'm asking myself, well, as a sales guy, what do I really need to make more money? Because I'm closing, in my opinion, quite a few deals. I had like a 36% close rate. And when I talked to everyone else in comparison... I was still among the top. So there wasn't a lot of growth there. And I went, well, I'm a good closer. If I had more leads to talk to, I'd close more leads. Like that's kind of basic math. So why don't I figure out marketing so that I can go get my own leads? And if I can get my own leads, I'll write my own paycheck. So that's what I did. I went and invested in a marketing program and spent two, three months worth of mortgage payments that I shouldn't have spent because I didn't tell my wife about it. And that's a whole nother story for the future of this conversation. But like I went and I made an investment in myself to learn this skill because I wanted to grow. I learned marketing and I started building sales funnels and websites. And I don't know how deep you guys have ever talked about it on this show, but anyone that's been in the marketing world, basically I built websites and ran paid Facebook ads to them to generate leads for our insurance company. And in doing oh. that, I was able to double my production in the business, which sounds really, really great, except I went from making $3,000 a month to making $4,000 a month. Even though I was going from 20000 in sales to 40000 in sales, the math didn't mm. math to me. And mm. I went, well, what the heck is going on? Yeah. And as you know, when you start selling more, the rest of the market got wind and I had some other agents called me and said, well, hey, how did you do that? And was it legal? <laughs> because that's how it yeah. always is, of course. So, so, guys, I learned this Facebook stuff. I'm doing marketing. I built these funnels. Like, I'll teach you how to do it. Sweet, you know, whatever. And they're like, no, no, no. I don't want to learn that. I'm a business owner. I don't have time. You just, how much to set it up for me? Hmm. And I went, well, I don't know, like 2,500 bucks. And they went, cool. Where do I send you the money? Build it for me. Make it happen. And Linda, I made $10,000 on a Saturday. One day, setting up Facebook ads, building websites that were just like copy and paste. That's one of those moments, you know, where you're just like, wait a second. I'm in the wrong business. What am I doing here? So, of course, I had the brilliant idea to walk away from that job that was like five years invested, everything I'd ever known, owned by a family member, caused a big ruckus to start a marketing business. 
And anyone that owns a marketing business will recognize that you can go and get all of your clients a ton of leads. But if they don't pick up the phone and call the damn leads, they're going to call you and complain and say that your business isn't doing a good job and that you're not delivering when the truth is, even though you delivered them all the things that they were promised, they didn't do their part. And Linda, I had one agent in particular, a real estate agent. I generated him 100 leads. He called me and asked me for a refund. It was my mortgage payments worth a refund, so I didn't want to give it to him because I'd already paid my mortgage with it. And so I picked up the phone and I started calling his leads. Now, I'm not a real estate agent. I've never held a license. I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express one time, but that does not qualify me to sell real estate. I started calling these leads and I kid you not, six people wanted to set showings to go and see it. And one person sent me an email with a signed contract on the property as is ready to go. And so I called the guy back and I'm like, hey, man. I don't know what you're doing over there, but you need to call the damn leads. Here's all this stuff. Like, here's a refund. Don't ever call me again, though. And I had a big joke and I called my marketer buddies in my little Facebook group. And I was like, I'm going to put call the damn leads on a T-shirt someday. And I'm going to sell it to all my marketing friends because ain't that the truth that if you get them leads, they got to call them. And that was four ish years ago. And it was kind of just a joke. And here we are. (laughs) Four years later, I walked away from a half million dollar a year salary at the corporate position I had worked at as a consultant for five years and said, let's go all in building this, sell our house in Texas, move into an RV, travel the country, and just know that you can literally live the life that you want to live if you're willing to do the work, call the damn leads, and if you're willing to go all in on yourself, because ultimately that's the best gamble that you can make because you're the one that gets to choose what you do every day and you get to decide what kind of life you live. Wow, that sounds like an ultimate great <laughs> life to live, like traveling in an RV and just letting the money come in through all your marketing. And so I want to talk about the sales and the marketing aspect because I've got a mentor as well and it's all about traffic, sales and marketing but and content but fulfillment mm-hmm. and that's where you mentioned call the damn leads and it's just interesting how businesses would love to have those extra leads but if you can't fulfill it, that's a different strategy too. But before we go into the fulfillment and all the marketing aspects, Let's talk a bit about the sales strategies because I was quite intrigued by the fact that you did so well with all the sales and you were a high performer. Can you talk about high ticket sales? And we know that it can be nerve wracking as well. How do you keep your cool when you're doing any high ticket sales and how do you close so well? What's the secret? Well, I'm going to give you a two part response to this, Linda, if you're open to it, just because I think this is a little more involved than just like a cliche answer. So the first part, and this was given to me by my mentor, he was really great at simplifying things on like all the complicated parts of sales and marketing. He was really great at simplifying it. And he said, sales requires two things. You need empathy and you need confidence. And empathy Mm -hmm. comes from your ability to ask questions and genuinely listen to what someone else says so that you can get on the same level that they're on because they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so that's where that empathy is really, really important because once you can build an emotional connection with someone, then it's just a matter of knowing, did I ask all the right questions to know where they are in their journey? And do I have a product or service that's a good fit to help them either get out of the pain that they're in because they're probably in pain. That's why they're trying to do this thing or they're seeking pleasure, which means that they're on a middle ground and they want more of something, right? Maybe they're okay, but they want to be better or they're good, but they want to be great. And so those are the two reasons. So when you can empathize and know where they're at and you know your product or service can get them that result, then all you got to do is be confident and be like, Linda, what you told me is that you want to be successful in sales and that if you have a system and a process that you can follow, you will follow it and that you will get the results because you're not afraid to do the work. Is that right? And you're going to go, well, yeah, Drew, of course, that's what I want. And I'm going to say, fantastic. The next step is to get you signed up in the program. We're going to take your first down payment of this. Once we enroll you, we're going to do X, Y, and Z, which is going to allow you to get this result really, really quickly, which is what's going to make you want to keep doing the thing. And I understand that there's going to be some work involved, but you know what's really great at the end of a hard workout? How great you feel about accomplishing that workout. So let's get right to work. Click here. How would you prefer to pay? Wire, credit card? What do you want to do next? Mm. Do you think when it comes to service businesses and coaches and stuff, a lot of them do have high ticket sales as well. What are your thoughts on that? And then 
setting the prices based on how much you value yourself? Because you mentioned before when you did your first 2,500 check, I'm guessing that would have been a really easy customer said, yep, here we go. So what are your thoughts on you know, how you should you set the price based on how much you value yourself? Is it all about experience over time, being more confident and knowing you've just broken that limit, that ceiling, and then you yeah, what are your thoughts oh, on that? Because you would probably would have yes, had some experience. No, no, I've got a great response. I want to, f- if you don't mind, I want to finish my second part answer to like the sales, the confidence and empathy. That's part one. Uh-huh. Yep. The other part of that is really just A, empathy and confidence and don't sell out of your own pocket. Because the biggest thing that most high ticket sales professionals, coaches, entrepreneurs get into is when they start selling their product or service, it's for significantly more than they've probably ever invested in themselves, which is why there's like a mental disconnect because if they've never made an investment of that amount or size into something for them, they feel Mm, awkward asking someone else to make that investment in themselves. And that's just a weird mindset shift, right? So you just got to get used to that. The other side of that, and this is kind of your second part of like, how do you price yourself? How do you value your time? This was one of the most powerful questions that's ever been asked to me and kind of why I started my entrepreneurial journey, why I started my marketing company. Because again, as I started having some success learning this marketing stuff, I was sharing that with other people because my theory is the more I pour into the cups of the people around me, the more room I'm making for the people upstairs to keep pouring into me, right? That's Mm -hmm. kind of like the abundance mindset that I had to learn was like, if I just keep giving it to everybody else, I'm making more room for me to figure stuff out. And so a wonderful woman named Nancy reached out to me and she says, Hey, you're in this Facebook group with me. I see you're posting in there about the success you're having and you're not trying to like sell everybody on buying your course or anything. You're just genuinely trying to help. I would like to pay you for your time to help me because I recognize it's valuable how much would an hour cost? And Linda, it was like a God moment because I was sitting there going, well, I make $15 an hour. And if I was working overtime, it would be 30. And this is special. So I was like, all right, Nancy, how about 50 bucks for an hour? And again, I'm selling like out of my own pocket, being scared to ask for $50. She's like, how about I send you 75? Yeah, that sounds great. That'd be awesome, right? Like, okay. So we set it up. I get on the call. We have a conversation. And it's like having this conversation right here where I'm literally just telling her all the things that I did that worked for me. And she, at the end of the call, is like, this was fantastic. It was super helpful. Thank you so much. She sends me a Venmo for 75 bucks. And I'll never forget. I screenshot it and send it to my wife. And I was like, babe how the heck do I do this like three times a day? Cause that would be my entire week's paycheck in three hours in a day. How do I do that? Mm. And that was why I started my marketing company because I'm like, well, my time is obviously worth more than the $12 an hour that I'm making sitting here making cold calls. Cause someone else is willing to pay me that. And then a week or two later, I got that call where it was like, Hey man, I'll pay you 2,500 bucks to set it up for me. And again, God was just going, Hey dude, Like you're worth far more than you're telling yourself or telling the world it's time for you to take that journey. And so I would recommend this is how I kind of started figuring out and how I coach my clients now is take all of the money that you made last year as a total. Maybe you have like a main job, a W-2 job. Maybe you have some side hustles, 1099. Maybe you have one of those websites where you share pictures of your feed or something. I'm not judging. I'm just saying (laughs) like all the money that you made. Put that all together in a big total. And then what you're going to do is you divide that total by the number 2,000. Because Why 2,000? I appreciate you asking. Because if you were an average individual, which no one here right now is average, like you're going above and beyond to listen to a show like this that Linda's putting out. So thank you. You're not average because you're here. But if you were, you would work 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year. You'd take a two-week vacation. And you would be an average individual, an average employee. So if as an average employee, you made $50,000 last year, your time is worth $25 an hour. If you made $100,000, your time is worth $50 an hour. And so you can kind of just do the math. And just, again, this is why I tell you, get a calculator, do the quick math, figure it out. Because here's what's really, really scary, Linda. 
as you start recognizing, I definitely spent more than 2,000 hours last year working because nobody just works their 40 and calls it a day. We always go above and beyond. So now you start recognizing that number dwindles a little bit. And then you start thinking about, well, I also went and had like a normal life. I spent time with my family and I had other relationships and I had to sleep. And so that number keeps dwindling down that every hour that you're alive is only worth a very small amount of money, 15, 10, whatever that number is, right? It's arbitrary for everyone's situation. And the even scarier part is if I put on a black cape and a hood and I knocked on your door and I said, hey, Linda, this sucks, but you have 24 hours left to live. Here's 50 bucks. I need you to come with me for an hour. Let's roll. What kind of response would you give me? Mm, no, that's not enough. Yeah. Yeah, it's not enough. Now, there might be a number at some point where you go, hey, for a million bucks, I don't know what you want to do, sir, but I only got 24 hours left. And I know that million can do a lot of good for the people I care about. So like game on, let's go play. And I'm not judging you for whatever that number is. Like everyone has a number because we all know money is a tool or a resource that we utilize to buy our time back or invest in the people, things, relationships that matter to us most. So why do we keep wasting our time or spending it on the things that don't matter? Why do we keep saying, hey, I'll go on that trip when? I'll call that person later. I'll do that thing if. What if it never happens? What if you're not guaranteed to know that you've got 10,163 days and 17 hours left? No one knows that but we still think and act and operate that way. At least I used to. I try not to anymore, but not perfect. Yeah. I totally agree with you. Time is just the most valuable assets. I guess looking back to, I look at back in my younger years where I wasted so much of my time. And so now I value it so much that I try to make the most of self-improvement, such as podcasting, reading books, learning, and not, yeah, just thinking about delegation in my work as well, like valuing my time as much as I can too. But that's something that I still have to work on too because I'm doing a coaching thing. I've got a mentor to help me do coaching to help others set up because I've got a vending machine business that's doing really well as well. And so I want to help Wonderful. others, but it's something new, but it's just valuing your time and setting it. My only problem is that I try to do too much because I love doing my podcast. <laughs> I've got my Guilty. e-commerce business and then <laughs> family as well. So I was just prioritizing those times and what's important as well. And you've got this thing called crush the day. Can you tell us about that philosophy and how can someone start applying that now? Absolutely. So the full phrase is crush the day before it crushes you. And for Mm -hmm. me, it really started when I was overweight, unfulfilled in the job, my relationship at home. Again, my wife and I have always loved each other immensely, but we went through seasons like all relationships do. And in that season, I wasn't showing up as my best self. I was making very selfish decisions. And when I flipped that switch, I remember I was like, I didn't have to be to work until eight. And my body would start rolling me around at like five in the morning. So I would just like smash the snooze button. And I'd be like, I'm not, you know, how miserable it can be. Like when you don't want to get up or you don't want to start the day or you get up early and then you get on your phone and there's like some toxic stuff on the news or some nasty stuff going on. You're just like, and the whole day is just ruined. That's being crushed by the day. So for me, my shift was, okay, I'm going to wake up when my body says to get up because clearly it's telling me it's time to get up for some reason. And at that point, instead of opening up the news or my phone to some nasty, like toxic bullshit, I'm going to start focusing on gratitude and I'm going to write down five things that I'm grateful for. And I had a mentor at the time that was like, you need to do this. It sounds woo woo and stupid, but just do it, kid. And I'm like, okay, you're more successful than me. Whatever you say, man, like I'm going to do it. So I started writing down five things I'm grateful for. And again, at one point, I weighed 315 pounds. Since then, have lost that twice. I don't want to be there anymore. I know if I don't work out first thing in the day, I'm not going to do it. Got that very clear and aware. I just won't do it. So I know that if I wake up and I focus on gratitude first, and then I go and I do my workout, which doesn't have to be insane. It doesn't have to be some crazy CrossFit gym thing. It doesn't have to be nuts. It's just being intentional with my body movement. If I get those couple things done first in the day, it really doesn't matter what else happens. I typically have the strength, confidence, and willpower to handle it. But when I don't do those things, 
and then shit gets sideways, the day crushes me. So I know every day when I wake up and look in the mirror, I'm like, hey, man, crush the day before it crushes you. Go do the things that you know you need to do. Go call the damn leads. Go do the workout. Go kiss your wife. Go tell your son you love him, right? Go do those things you know you need to do. Crush the day so it doesn't crush you. And that's kind of the mantra that I've tried to live by. And again, I share everything I do on social media because as an, weirdly enough to say, an influencer of people, sharing those stories, putting that out there and tagging myself in the douchey selfie at 5 a.m. when I walk out the door and being like, oh, here we are going once again. It feels really lame sometimes. But you know what's not lame? When I get a message from someone that's like, hey, man, I've been following your journey. And I really appreciate you posting those pictures because it motivated me to start getting up earlier. Now, I'm not getting up at five, but what used to be eight is now seven. And I'm working on 630. And I just wanted to say thank you. And it was so powerful to me. And that's why I continue to share the stories and put it out there. Because for me, crushing the day is really important. I know that if I'm intentional with what I do every day, it's going to be a better day. And so continuing to say that thing to every morning when I get up and being like, man, I crushed the day today. Thank you, Lord. I appreciate you. It's, mm. it's been good for me and a lot of other people at this point. Wow, that's powerful. And I love the fact that you can motivate and inspire people. And you're not aware that you're doing it, but it, like if you've got a following and people follow you over time, I get inspired by people too. And that pushes me. That's why I reached out to my mentor as well. So I know the feeling there. I want to remind people that success is a perspective. So for me, my version is going to be different than Linda's version. And for the listener, it's probably different than what your version is. And if you ask our parents what they thought we would be as a successful person, it's really different. But it's important to know that it's your version that's important. You are the one that gets to decide what success looks like. And if it's making millions of dollars and traveling the world and having yachts and Lamborghinis, awesome. Go do that. If your version is like making enough money that all your bills are paid and you get to create a podcast and you get to spend time with your family and the people that matter, do that. Don't let someone mm -hmm. else tell you that your version is wrong. Go do what's right for you. And in doing so, it's interesting how you can help so many other people take that same journey for themselves. Yeah. I always ask for my guests usually how they define success personally. And everybody has a unique, different story. I love hearing different, unique versions of what success means to that person. I mentioned like the family part because your family and your marriage you mentioned redefining time saved your marriage. So you, can you share the story about that and give yes, some and, advice and on that? For the sake of time, because I know you've got some more stuff to do after this and I got to get back to my family because it's getting late in the evening. But I will share this. It was really important because one of the things, as I mentioned earlier, I made a lot of selfish decisions when I started going all in on personal development and entrepreneurship because I knew I needed to be a better me. And I did that. I went all in. I started reading the books and I stayed up late and I was on podcasts and doing all the things that like I needed to do. But what I wasn't doing was stopping on my journey to look back and make sure that my family was there with me. And I know there's an entrepreneur out there right now listening to this that recognizes that they are telling the world they're creating a legacy they're living in this mental state of like building and grinding and hustling. And it's like, I'm doing this for my family. And this is like, oh, yes. And I know that I've been there. Yeah. Here's what I know, though. Even if you're in the living room watching the movie with them at the end of the night, if you're mentally in that future that you're building, they are sitting in the room asking where you are because you're checked out. And just because you're present doesn't mean that you're a presence in their life. And for me, that was the mistake that I made. And my wife, thank God for her because she will not take no bullshit. She came mm. to me Christmas Eve of 2019 and she handed me her wedding ring back and said, listen, I love you. I support wow. you, but you're married to the job and the business right now. And your family needs you. So you need to make a decision. If this is the most important thing to you, go do that and we will support you. But we have to do it from afar and we probably won't be here when you're done. Wow. That would have been painful. It was a rough Christmas. Let's just say that. However, I did realize, though, that even though I was spending time there with them, I wasn't actually spending the time with any like form of return on investment. I wasn't measuring the growth. 
And as an entrepreneur, we all know what gets measured gets improved. If you don't put more money in than you take out every month, like it's going to be really bad. And I was taking out a lot more than I was putting into the relationship. And so for me, recognizing time as a value of, hey, dummy, just within the last two years, someone came to you and was like, what is your time worth? And why are you spending it where you're spending it? Now you have to start rethinking about how you're making that time valuable and what investment is creating a return. So I created the four sixes because I see, and I think Linda, you'll agree with me, there's 24 hours in a typical day, right? And you're over in in Sydney, Australia. I'm here in Ohio in the US. And even though we're in two completely different parts of the world and time zones, we still recognize there's 24 hours in a day for now right? Unless you want to get weird and that's a different show altogether. And to me, there's four areas of life that are really, really important. Number one is sleep. Because again, I was a drug dealer and I ran the streets and I'm 48, 72 hours with no sleep. You're just not a good human being. I'm sorry to say that. And -hmm. anyone who's had to stay up late because their kids wouldn't sleep or they were doing something like you just know it's not a good thing. So you got to sleep. And then, as I had mentioned, most of us, we were saying we're putting our families first, those relationships, like everything's for our family, our legacy. And like, that's cool. I subscribe to that for a while. We'll buy that for now. Then we have our business because we don't have FU money yet, right? You wouldn't be sitting here hanging out on a podcast trying to learn how to grow and get better if you had FU money. So respectfully, we all got to work every day. And that's cool because I love work. So to me, even when I have a few money, I'll probably still be working because it's just something I love. And you probably love Mm -hmm. it too, which is why you're creating a podcast on top of the businesses and all the other things you have going on, right? And interestingly enough though, Linda, a lot of people put themselves last on that list of important things to do every day, which is why they get burnout, which is why you get out of shape, which is why you're unhappy, you're unhealthy. Like this all snowballs really, really quickly. But if you've ever been on an airplane, The first thing they tell you in the safety briefing is you have to put your own oxygen mask on first so you become a burden to everyone else around you. So how interesting that humans put themselves last on the list of important things, but then run around talking about how hard they work and how much they have to pour into everyone around them when they don't really have anything to pour out because they're not putting themselves at the top of the list. They're not making sure that they're at peak performance, that they're at the ability to do and leverage everything that they're great at and possible to do. But they're making all these promises. They're telling everybody they are. And so for me, when people talk about how do you live a balanced life, balance is BS, right? A balanced skill, read zero. Okay, cool. We can subscribe to that too. But if I know there's 24 hours in a day and there's four areas of life that are really important to me, and again, your version is going to be different, but we can kind of agree four areas to me that are really important. Well, 24 divided by four is six, the four sixes. Because if you've ever spent six hours on something that you really enjoy, a project, a task, going fishing, spending time with a loved one in bed, watching Netflix and chilling, right? Like six hours, you can do a lot of things. You can have a lot of fun. You can really enjoy that. So what if you lived every day and you knew that you were going to be very intentional with six hours on you, six hours on your relationships and your family, six hours on your business? And, you know, most people can get by on six hours of sleep. Consult your physician. I'm not a doctor, yada, 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 whatever. But like to me, that's about as balanced as it's going to get. And if that's what I know is possible... And I know that if I spend six hours working every day and I spend a couple hours calling the damn leads and I spend an hour recording a podcast here and I go and do some admin work, I'm going to do more in that day than most people do in three days. Because most people in an eight hour work day, they're spending time goofing off. They're watching Netflix or they're doing whatever. And that's how you can really start to figure this out. Because if you want a tactical way to truly change your life, First question is, what's your time worth? Go and do that. What did you make divided by 2,000? Now you know what your time's worth. Next thing you do is you go and do a time study and you make a note in your calendar at the top of every hour and you start going, okay, what did I do for that hour from the moment I woke up to the moment I went to bed? Well, for me, it kind of looks like this. Alarm goes off at 4 a.m. First thing I did was write down the five things I'm grateful for. I drank a big glass of water 
I got up, I went, I made my wife's coffee, got that ready. I took my pre-workout. I went out the door. I did a 60 minute walk while I was walking. I scrolled YouTube. I did whatever. That's my time to meditate. And for me, fine. When I got back, I took a shower. I made breakfast. I spent some time with my kid, my wife. We did this, this, and this. Here's what's going to happen for you as you start doing this. By day two, day three, you're going to be cursing me and talking about how much you hate me for making you aware of how much of the most valuable thing that you have that you're wasting. Because we can't buy time. We can't win it in a poker tournament. And you're not going to get a card or a box full of it on your birthday. So why are you spending it in the things and places that are not going to get you a return on that investment? And it doesn't have to be a monetary return because money's not everything. But if you're going to invest that time, it should get you a return on that investment, in my opinion. I love it. That's a powerful answer there. Mindful of time, I wanted to talk about your brand and how you built it. And how did you grow your brand? What platforms have helped you the most and any tips that you can give for an entrepreneur trying to build their brand or help with the growth of their company too? Any tips that you could share there? I would love to share as much as I possibly can. And again, for the sake of time, I'm going to try to keep it as brief and short as possible. For me, again, Call the Damn Leads as a brand, it came from something that was literally a part of what was going on in my life. I'm a sales professional. I was learning marketing Any marketing sales professional, any business owner that's invested in marketing knows that if you're going to spend money to get leads, you should probably pick up the phone and call them because that's how you get paid. I thought it was funny. It resonated with me when I made that joke in other crowds. People thought it was funny. So like, I leaned in on that. And I would say that you, the listener right now, there are things that you have a familiarity with that you're constantly talking about with others in your marketplace right now. There's probably a product or a service that you've been wanting to bring because you know it can help people. And this is your permission slip to go do it. Because the biggest hurdle most people face in their journey is themselves. They're just afraid to try because they don't want to look stupid. They don't want to fail. So just go and try it. Because that to me was like a lot of people when I started saying, hey, I'm going to put that on a T-shirt and sell it. And I'm going to do it. They're like, that's not going to work. No professional is ever going to say, call the damn leads. No business is ever going to hire you to come in and teach their sales team when you're selling call the damn leads and you got tattoos all over your hand. Like no one's going to do that. Guess what? I've made multiple, multiple six figures from calling the damn leads, from branding and just telling people to call the damn leads. And it was all about just leaning in on what I knew was authentic to me because that's the big thing I also feel like a lot of people try to do is sell something that's not authentically them, which is why their messaging doesn't hit correctly, which is why they just seem like they're begging for business all the time and they can't get anyone to talk to them because they're not actually talking to the people they should be talking to. In life, when you get in the right room with the right people and have the right conversations, that's when the right things start happening. But the right room is not for someone who's faking it to be there. If you have to fake to be there, you're not building authentic relationships. And in 2024, when we're recording this episode, now more than ever, authentic relationships are incredibly important for branding. How quickly are people abandoning or canceling brands because they said or did something that they don't align with? You have to be authentically you. And sometimes by leaning in on authenticity, brands go absolutely crazy Because people are like, you know what? Yes, that's me and I'm them and let's freaking go. And so for me, Mm -hmm. I found that as I lean in on call the damn leads, anyone who's a sales professional or been on that grind, that's the response that they get. And so transparently, Linda, I'll share this with you. My goal is that within five years of this moment, you can't walk through an airport or a sales event in the world. used to be the country, but I got to think bigger in the world without seeing call the damn leads somewhere, because I know sales is always growing. It will always exist. And I want to get out there and help more people feel motivated to live the life they can by just doing the work. And that's really what call the damn leads is all about. 
That's pretty powerful. And then I love that vision as well, growing that brand so worldwide. Think big as well. And like you said, sales is definitely never going away and it's the lifeblood of all businesses. So you're Absolutely. in a good opportunity there. Despite AI revolution, there's always going to be sales too. So that's pretty powerful. <laughs> if there's any key message that you want to leave the audience, what would that be? Trust the process. Because as much as you can learn and get all of the hows that you want, the hardest thing to do for 99.9% .9 of us is trusting the process because overnight success happens 10, 20, 30 years in the making. This is all stuff that's a combination and a snowball effect of the work that you're doing now, the work that you did yesterday, and the work that you're going to do every day moving forward that you're blessed to wake up. And so I would say trust the process because far too many people walk away from their greatness right before it's about to happen. That's why I was saying earlier, like this is your permission slip to go and do the thing that you've been wanting to do that no one else will tell you to do because they're afraid for you. It's not that they don't want you to win. It's that they wouldn't go and do that for themselves, which is why they're pushing that on you because they don't want to see you get hurt because they wouldn't do the work necessary. You have that greatness. So go do the thing that you know you're called to do. And if it doesn't work out, no big deal. It's going to work out because you're going to do the work. And that's the difference between you and them. Perfect. Guys, if you found this as valuable as I did, please do me a favor and share this episode with somebody. If you're listening on the podcast, please hit the follow button. It does help the channel grow. And if you're watching on YouTube, please hit the subscribe and the like button and leave a comment on what your thoughts are as well. Thank you so much for your time, Drewby. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. I'm grateful to be here. Thank you to the listener also. Make sure you share this episode if you got some value. That's what's going to bring us the most appreciation from this.